Welcome everyone to chapter three of human biology. In this chapter, we're going to talk about the cell and the different types of cells that we find in the universe period. So we'll spend a little bit of time talking about bacteria and other prokaryotes. And then we will dive right into your cells, the cells that we find in the human biology, and exactly what their form is and what their job is. So without further ado, let's go ahead and dive right on in. So before we start talking about these cells, the first thing we want to actually have an understanding of is the cell theory. So we talked about the cell theory a little bit in chapter one when we talked about what is a theory. But the cell theory basically states that all cells come from pre-existing cells. So all the cells that make up your body, that make up a plant, that make up a bacteria, they didn't just pop out of thin air, they actually came from pre-existing cells. We consider the cells of your body to be the basic unit of life. So we have various different types of cells and they have various different types of functions and they have various different types of structures. And on this picture, we're just looking at a handful of some of these different cells and their jobs. So we have red blood cells and amongst those red blood cells, you see um, there are white blood cells in there as well. You have nerve cells. Look, notice how the nerve cells, they have these dendrites and these axons, these really long skinny parts that go away from the cell. Um, and then the this kind of array of dendritic extensions that come at the cell that so that it can send and receive messages. They look very different from what blood cells look like. This, my friend, is a bone cell. And all these little nicks along, it looks like a tree trunk, right? This whole thing. This, These are all bone cells, or what we call osteocytes. So as you can probably tell already, that there are various different types of cells that make up your body, and they all have various different types of functions. But what we're gonna do in this chapter is that we're gonna talk about some of the basic aspects of all of these cells that they share with one another. And then as we get into chapter four and the remaining chapters of this book, then we will talk about some specifics of the osteocytes and red blood cells or erythrocytes and nerve cells. So cells are typically really small, and the reason that they're small is because they want to have a surface area to volume ratio that will allow it to be able to take nutrients and take other items across the surface of the cell. So the smaller the cells are, the larger amount of surface area there is compared to the volume that's on the inside of the cell. If we have an increase in surface area, uh, with that increase in surface area, we're able to have the cell take in more nutrients and pass more waste to exit outside of the cell in a much more efficient way. So because of that, there's kind of a limit to how large a cell can really be in order to be efficient and metabolically active. So how we ever discovered these cells is thanks to some really ingenious people and some really curious people like Anton von Leeuwenhoek, who designed the first microscope. So what his microscope is that he used a series of lenses and he had a pinhead there and he would put things like fecal matter or things that were floating in the tea at the tip of this head um, and then look through a magnifying glass to see what was in there. Now with his magnifying glass and this rudimentary microscope, you really couldn't see things on the level of a cell, but sometimes you could see plant cells that were in corks. So um, plant cells um, are a little bit larger. They have those boxes, they're a little bit more fine. But with what von Leeuwenhoek did with this microscope, it kind of led the way for what we use today to look at all kinds of cells, and that is a compound light microscope. We use a compound light microscope most readily in human biology courses because we are able to view living specimens under there. Now, it doesn't have as high a magnification or resolving power as, say, an electron microscope, but we can view live specimens, so that's what makes it one of the microscopes that is most readily used in human biology. So here we have what are pictures, or what we call micrograph pictures, of human red blood cells. So we have a light microscope picture of it, and you see these little guys here. They're little flattened donut shapes. Um, if we use a transmission electrons microscope, which has a higher resolving power and a higher magnification, we can see these the outside of these cells um, a little bit more definedly. Um, and you can see the inside of the red blood vessel, um, the blood vessel much better as well. And then we have scanning electron micrographs. So you can clearly see that depending on the type of microscope you use, you're gonna have a different picture. Now, while electron microscopes are really cool and they give you really great resolving power and they give you a really um, 
great magnification. The only issue is that we have to stain the specimen with these really heavy metals, so we can't have any live specimens that we look at. But the way that electron microscopes work is that instead of using a beam of light to magnify the image, they're going to use a beam of electron. And by doing so, they can magnify things to um, a size that even the human eye can't even see, and then that image will be protect projected on a screen. With scanning electron microscopes, instead of getting a two-dimensional image like we get for the transmission electron microscope, we still use a beam of electrons in order to magnify the object. Um, we have a much, much, much higher magnification, and we get a three-dimensional picture, and that was evident by... If we go here, this is a nice three-dimensional image of the red blood cell as opposed to the two-dimensional images we saw in transmission and in the light microscope. So we get a much more well-rounded picture in a scanning electron microscope. But once again, we have this huge drawback that we can't really look at live specimens. So we could take all of the cells in the world that we know of, and we can clump them into two categories. They're either prokaryotic or they're eukaryotic. Prokaryotes are typically much smaller than eukaryotic cells. They have no nucleus or other membrane-bound organelles, and the best examples of prokaryotic cells are bacteria and archaea, those two domains that we talked about in chapter one. Eukaryotic cells, on the other hand, are much larger. They do have membrane-bound organelles, and they do have a nucleus. Um, the types of cells that are eukaryotic cells are those that are found in animals, plants, fungi, or protists, or basically everything in the domain of eukarya that we also talked about in Chapter 1. So the ones that we are most concerned with in human biology are going to be eukaryotic cells. So what we're looking at is a transmission electron micrograph picture of a typical eukaryotic cell. And the things that we see in this picture, you see this big giant glob, that's the nucleus. So that nucleus has genetic material in there. We have our nucleolus in there. We have chromatin material or the DNA. And then we have the outside covering of the nucleus. And then surrounding the cell, we're going to have the endomembrane system and various different types of organelles, including the mitochondria, lysosomes, etc. Etc. Et now, this right here is just an artist's rendition of a typical eukaryotic cell. So we can see a little bit more definition here because we had someone actually draw this cell for us. But we still have the nucleus and the nucleolus, and we have um, the endomembrane system with our rough endoplasmic reticulum because it has ribosomes on it that helps to make proteins. We have our smooth endoplasmic reticulum that helps to make lipids. Mitochondria, the powerhouse of the cell that makes our ATP. Golgi apparatus is like your shipping and receiving hub of the cell. Mostly shipping doesn't really receiving it. Well, it receives packages to be shipped out externally from the cell. Um, we have lysosomes, which are the um, where cellular degradation takes place. So um, cellular digestion takes place with the lysosomes. We have different types of filaments that help to maintain the integrity of the cell. We have different proteins that are embedded in the plasma membrane. So there's all sorts of stuff that's happening and going on within this typical eukaryotic cell. So what I want you to kind of understand, though, is that not all of these structures are always found in all eukaryotic cells. And we understand that from the way that we looked at that nerve cell, the blood cell, um, and the very first couple of slides here that not all cells in the body are created equal. So there are some structures that you will find on one cell that you may not necessarily find on another cell, but that's okay. So what we're looking at now and what this chapter really just wants to cover is just give you an overview of what eukaryotic cells generally have and more importantly what the functions are of these different structures of eukaryotic cells. So first and foremost, both types of cells, whether you're eukaryotic or prokaryotic, they have a plasma membrane. And the job of the plasma membrane is to be selectively permeable, permeable which means that there are some molecules that can freely cross, go across the membrane, while other molecules cannot. So it kind of regulates what enters in and out of the cell. On the inside of the cell, both prokaryotes and eukaryotes have a cytoplasm. And that's just that semi-fluid goo that everything else floats into. So for a eukaryotic cell, the organelles or internal compartments within the cells to be floating in the cytoplasm. For prokaryotic cells, they don't have any organelles, so their ribosomes would be floating in that as well as their chromatic material or their DNA. So the first cells that were on this earth were probably prokaryotes, and that's why we're going to talk about them, even though we really don't 
the focus of this course is not on prokaryotic cells, um, it's important to understand your history. And there actually are the Archaeans or the ancestors of eukaryotic cells. In the beginning, the atmosphere didn't really have any oxygen. And there are actually still some Archaeans or some prokaryotic cells that can survive in really inhospitable conditions, um, such as thermal vents at the very bottom, very lower and deep highly pressurized parts of the ocean, um, places that have very little oxygen, they can live in those places. Eukaryotic cells evolved from archaea through a um, process that we call the endosymbiotic theory, which basically means that organelles developed from um, eukaryotes eating or engulfing other prokaryotic cells. If we look at the size and shape of a mitochondria, it's about the same size and shape as a prokaryotic bacillus type shell um, cell. So we think that perhaps eukaryotic cells engulfed these cells and they formed this symbiotic relationship where it's kind of like I scratch your back, you scratch my back, and then we all live happily together. So the plasma membrane is not just this little plastic sheet that hangs around the cell and um, just kind of holds all the goo inside. It's actually a highly organized and it's highly complex. So what we're looking at here is just an artist's rendition of a plasma membrane. What we find is that we have those phospholipid bilayer like we talked about in chapter two with a glycerol head and the phosphate neck as well as those fatty acid tails. It forms a bilayer because the fatty acid tails are hydrophobic and the heads are hydrophilic. They like to be associated with the water. Um, this fluid membrane actually has embedded with it different types of proteins. Some are proteins that are transmitters and they will actually communicate between the outside and the inside of the cell and communicate with other cells. Some of these proteins are actually meant to be transporters and they will transport materials in and out of the cell as well. So there's a lot of things happening on this plasma membrane. But remember the basic job of it is to be selectively permeable. So at body temperature, the plasma membrane has about the consistency of an oil. And we use the model to really describe the plasma membrane as a fluid mosaic model, which means that the proteins and the phospholipids, they are free to move around um, and they're never in the same place all the time. It's not very stoic. Um, it's actually quite dynamic and it's always constantly moving. There are cholesterol molecules, which remember is a lipid when all, um, and it's a lipid and it's a steroid. They're also embedded within the plasma membrane of human cells, animal cells, and it helps to maintain the integrity or give it support. You have different types of glycoproteins and glycolipids, um, and a lot of these are meant to be self-identifiers, so they're antigens on the surface of the cell that says, hey, I'm a cell that's supposed to be in part of this body, and they can even act as receptors and communicate information from one cell to the next. So very highly organized, highly complex is the plasma membrane. So some main proteins act as channels, as we saw before, um, letting things go in and out. Uh, molecules that are really small or hydrophobic substances can can hydrophobic substances can pass freely through the plasma bilayer. Things like gases and carbon carbon dioxide they can freely go go across the plasma membrane um, through diffusion. But larger things and things that are nonpolar, they need a little help getting through. So that's really what the job is of those proteins is to kind of help regulate what goes through so they can act as channel. Water can go across the plasma membrane through special types of channels called aquaporins. So here, this is just a really cool picture of showing some of this stuff. So small non-charged molecules, they can very easily just go across via diffusion. Charged particles, um, anything that has a charge to it, they cannot go across via diffusion, so they'd have to go through this protein channel. And even really large macromolecules, so like those large lipids we talked about, carbohydrates, um, nucleic acids, um, proteins, they're too big to just go across the plasma membrane. So in order for them to get across, they have to go through these protein channels. So since we're talking about things going across the plasma membrane, how does stuff get across the plasma membrane? Well, there are really, um, just a handful of ways that this is done. 
to summarize it, to break it down, either a cell can expend energy to move things across the plasma membrane, and we call that active transport, or a cell does not have to expend energy to move things across the plasma membrane, and that we call passive transport. So first, let's talk about the different types of passive transports. Diffusion is the most basic type of passive transport, where there is the movement of objects from an area of high concentration to low concentration, and that movement takes place until the molecules are pretty much equally distributed on both the inside and the outside of the cell. Although molecules are always moving in both directions in order to maintain that equilibrium, there's really no neck movement once equilibrium has been achieved um, because the same number of molecules are on one side of the membrane are also on the other side of the membrane. So here we have a beautiful picture of this diffusion taking place. So we have these, the water, as you can tell, those are H2O molecules, and then you have this particle. So the water is the solvent, the particle is the solute. So we are looking at the movement of the solute is what we're concerned with, that particle on there. So this is a particular particle that can cross the plasma membrane. Okay, Remember, not all of them can, but in this example, this is a molecule that can cross the plasma membrane. So this molecule is much more highly concentrated on the outside of the cell than it is on the inside of the cell. So as a result, that molecule is going to overwhelmingly at first move more into the cell over time. But then there will be some movement of molecules out of the cell, but the rate of movement out of the cell is equal to the rate of the movement inside of the cell because equilibrium has been achieved. So right now, diffusion is just the movement of the molecules or the solutes. Um, from an area of high concentration to low concentration. So you're probably asking yourself, what about water? Does water also exhibit diffusion or passive transport? And it absolutely does. But the diffusion of water has a special name. We call it osmosis. So osmosis is just the movement of water from an area of high concentration to low concentration. Normally, your body fluids like to say, be in what we consider an isotonic state. So that means that the concentration of water and solutes is equal both inside of the cell and outside of the cell. When your cells are in a nice isotonic environment, the cells don't really change size or change shape at all because there is no net movement or water um, leaving the cell causing it to shrink or too much water getting into the cell causing it to expand. However, there are some situations where that can change. If the cell is put in a hypotonic solution, that means that the solution has a higher concentration of water but very few solids, very few solid particles. As a result, remember, water is still going to exhibit osmosis. So because there is a lower concentration of water on the inside of the cell than there is on the outside of the cell, if a cell is in a hypotonic solution, water has the tendency to move into the cell. When it does that, it causes the cell to swell and it can even burst, or what we call lysis. Hypertonic solutions are the exact opposite. So in a hypertonic solution, there are many, 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 many solutes on the outside of the cell with a lower concentration of water. So the water concentration is actually higher on the inside of the cell than in a hypertonic solution. So as a result, that water is going to have the tendency to move out in order for equilibrium to be balanced. When water moves out of that cell, it's going to now cause it to shrink, or what we call crenation. Um, and it can actually shrink and shrivel up and die. Classic example of a hypotonic solution is distilled water, where there aren't a whole lot of solutes in distilled water. It's been distilled. Hypertonic solutions, uh, a great example of that is salt water. Lots and lots and lots of particles in that salt water, i.e. salt. And so if you put a red blood cell in salt water, it has the tendency to pull that water out of the cell in order for equilibrium to be reached with the water. And it will cause the cell to shrivel up. If you've ever drank salt water, you know that it will dehydrate you. And the force that actually drives this osmo osmosis is what we call osmotic pressure. So here we have a cell in all those three different types of tenacity we talked about. In an isotonic solution, that cell is very happy. There's an equal amount of water that's both entering and leaving the cell. Most of your body fluids, as long as everything is the way that it should be, are in an isotonic state. However, we can sometimes have cells in a hypotonic solution, distilled water as an example, and you notice that water is now going to go into the cell, causing them to swell up and possibly even burst. In a hypertonic solution, water is going in the opposite direction, where water is leaving out of that cell and going into the aqueous solution surrounding it, because it has a much lower concentration of water, relatively speaking, compared to the inside of that cell. 
So other types of task force still in the passive transport category, because remember we have passive transport and active transport that we're going to talk about today, is facilitated transport. So this is a transport of molecules across the membrane from an area of higher concentration to lower concentration, but unlike diffusion, they can't just go across the plasma membrane. They have to actually go through a protein carrier. Like diffusion, the cell just still does not have to expend any energy, so we consider it passive transport. Protein transporters are really specific, and there are only certain molecules that can be moved by these protein transporters. So not everything can kind of sneak through through this facilitated transport protein molecule. It's very specified. So as you can see here, this glucose molecule needs to get into the cell, much higher concentration outside than in, but in order for it to get in, it has to go through this transporter molecule, and then this little protein jobby over here, it's not able to get in. So it can only go through this transporter because it is shaped specifically for this particular molecule. So now we're going to go on to the other type of transports, and these are active transports. Passive transports did not have to expend any energy. Active transports, it does have to expend energy. In addition to that, instead of moving molecules from a high concentration to a low concentration, as we did with all of our passive, passive transport mechanisms, we have to move molecules from a lower concentration to a higher concentration. And in order to do that, we have to expend energy, and we usually have to have some sort of protein carrier, which is many times called a pump. The most famous and the most talked about, or we're going to talk talk about a human biology pump is the sodium potassium pump. So with the sodium potassium pump, the way that it works is that for every three sodium molecules it pumps out, it's going to take in two potassium molecules. This is super important when we start talking about the nervous system. In order to power this pump, we have to take one of those high energy phosphates and donate it to the pump and boom, we have the use of ATP um, that helps to power this pump to move those sodium ions out and bring those potassium ions into the cell in order to um, establish the functionality of the nervous system, and we'll talk about specifically how that happens in a few chapters. Other type of active transport is bulk transport, and this is like your endocytosis and your exocytosis. Endocytosis can be broken down into three different types. Um, phagocytosis, which is cellular eating, so it's just bringing in large things inside the cell. Um, we do that typically with bacteria by white blood cells. We're going to, endocy um, through endocytosis, bring those pathogens in and then hook them up with the lysosome to completely degrade them. Pinocytosis is kind of cellular drinking. Pino is Latin for to drink, um, and that is bringing just small gulps of fluid on the inside or small particles on the inside. Of the and then we have receptor-mediated endocytosis, where there are particles that have to bind to receptors on the plasma membrane, and then that will actually trigger the endocytosis process to take place. So here are those three different types of bulk um, transport, where we had just regular good old-fashioned phagocytosis, pinocytosis, and receptor-mediated endocytosis. Notice that these little orange jobbies are the receptors, and then the little green balls must fit those orange jobbies to actually turn on this process of bringing those molecules within the cell. Exocytosis is just moving molecules outside of the cell. It's pretty much the reverse of endocytosis. So now let's talk about some of those different organelles. And I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time talking about the various organelles within the cell because I do believe that you have had a lot of this information um, in previous biology classes that you've had from kindergarten on up. So the nucleus is pretty much the brain of the cell, if you will. So it contains all the genetic information on how to make the proteins, the lipids, and how the cell should function. The endomembrane system is just a series of membranous organelles that help to bring the wishes of the nucleus to light. So we have things like the rough ER, the smooth ER, the Golgi apparatus, lysosomes, um, and various other structures that help to make the materials that are needed by the cell. So we're starting off with the nucleus. It contains the genetic information of the cell, has the DNA, and contains the, the chromatin and the chromosomes when the cell is dividing. Um, DNA is made up of genes, which contain all the structures for making all the proteins of the body. There's also nucleoplasm, which is just the cytoplasm inside the nucleus, and then you have your nucleolus, which is just this really concentrated dark region on the inside of the nucleus, and its job is to produce ribosomes. And here we have our beautiful nucleus. It has this double nuclear envelope, and there are these nuclear pores through which 
um, the ribosomes are able to get out and the messenger RNA is also able to get out of the cell. So the job of ribosomes, and they're made up of ribosomal RNA and protein, is to be the site of protein synthesis. So that is its really big, important job. Um, we can find ribosomes either free-floating in the cytoplasm, or we can find ribosomes attached to the endoplasmic reticulum. When they're attached to that, this particular type of endoplasmic reticulum, we call it the rough ER. And those, that is the area by which that proteins are made. So whenever you see ribosomes, I want you to think of protein synthesis. Rough endoplasmic reticulum studded with ribosomes makes proteins. There is a smooth endoplasmic reticulum. It does not have any ribosomes. Its job is to make the various lipids that are needed by the cell. Um, the Golgi apparatus is a series of flattened sucks, and they take that, those proteins and those lipids, and they modify them um, and pack, repackage them, process them, and then they secrete them outside the body or send them to wherever they're supposed to go. So the rough ER, the smooth ER, the Golgi apparatus are like the big players in this endomembrane system. So here's a really cool picture that's showing all that good stuff happening. So the instructions are coming out from that nucleus and attached very intimately with the nucleus are, is the rough ER studded with those ribosomes that make their different types of proteins. Um, the molecules that are made are then shipped and transported the transport vesicles to the Golgi apparatus where it will refine the materials and then reship them to either be secreted outside of the cell. And you're probably wondering, well, why would anything need to be secreted outside of the cell? I thought it would just make stuff for itself to survive. Well, you sweat, you have oil, those sorts of things need to be secreted outside of the cell. Um, the different to make your, your hair come out and grow um, your skin cells to have that kind of keratinization that takes place to kind of make them a little water resistant so that you don't just completely mush away when you get in the shower. Um, those are various different types of secretions that have to go out. So there are some things that the cell needs to secrete in order for it to survive and in order for the organ system to function as we need to. Um, hormones, neurotransmitters, all sorts of cool stuff. So vesicles and lysosomes are kind of like uh, the next level of um, items that work in the endomembrane system. Vesicles' job is are they're just little tiny membranous sacs, and they transport things throughout the cell. And then lysosomes are filled with hydrolytic enzymes that break down molecules into much smaller parts. So we can use lysosomes for intracellular digestion to break down food molecules that come into the cell. We can use lysosomes to break down bacteria that's been phagocytized by the cell. The cytoskeleton is our next structure, and really the big job of the cytoskeleton is to just to maintain the cell shape and anchor or move organelles within the, the cell. Um, we have different types of microtubules, we have um, different intermediate filaments, we can have actin filaments and myosin filaments depending on what type of cell we're talking about. Um, so we can talk about muscle cells, we'll talk about actin and myosin and the interaction with those cells that allows for muscle contractions to take place. So depending on the type of cell you have, there may be a varied type of, of a or cytoskeleton. So microtubules um, are assembled and controlled by the centromere. They help to maintain the cell's shape, and they also help to move molecules um, throughout the cell. It's kind of like the internal railway system, if you will. Actin filaments are made of this protein actin, and they're involved in movement. Intermediate filaments um, have various different functions, um, and the size of them is in between actin filaments and microtubules. Cilia and flagella are structures that you don't see on every single cell, um, but on those cells that you do find them, their job is for movement. Um, the cilia is found in the respiratory tract. It moves the mucus um, towards the throat and up and away from the lungs. Um, flagella are only found on those cells that uh, for cells, their flagella are only found on sperm um, cells, and they help to propel the sperm towards the egg. And here's just a really cool picture of some cilia and flagella. The internal structure of them is kind of a little bit different, but their whole job is for movement. So we have flagella and we have our cilia. <laughs> 
So the extracellular matrix is just a protective mesh um, of proteins and polysaccharides um, that surrounds the cell that produces it. And that extracellular matrix can contain things like collagen, which makes, um, it's a really cool protein that resists stretching and pulling. And actually they say um, collagen is much more it's stronger and more powerful than even steel is um, because of the way that the proteins are made. We have elastin, which can actually provide some resilience. Um, fibrinogen that helps to maintain um, the protein on the outside and also plays a role in cell signaling. So we're going to talk about more of that extracellular matrix when we get into chapter four and we start talking about the various different tissue types that make up the body. And then here's a really cool picture of some of that extracellular matrix out here where we have our collagen fibers and we have some of our elastic fibers out here, um, proteoglycan or some of this other um, fibrous material that helps to kind of maintain um, the framework of the different uh, layers of the body. So to help cells communicate with one another and to help cells to um, form different tissues, because as you remember from chapter one, um, atoms form molecules, molecules form cells, cells form tissues, tissues form organs, organs form organ systems, organ systems form organisms, and so forth. So there has to be some sort of working communication between these cells. So they're not just these entities that are allowing to exist in and of themselves and they don't have communication with anything else. They're all always working together. In order to facilitate this cooperation, there are three main types of junctions that we're going to see between cells. We have adhesion junction, where they are the cytoskeletons of adjacent cells are attached together. We have tight junctions that have a barrier that's produced between the two of them. And then we have gap junctions that will it's kind of microtubules or protein channels fused together and allow those cells to communicate with one another. So here was an example of our adhesion junction where we have these filaments of a cytoskeleton attached together. And then we have these tight junctions where they're kind of riveted with one another. So, but through, by these proteins and there isn't really anything that can go between them, but it helps to make a nice solid foundation. So can you imagine if you didn't have any tight junctions for your skin cells, if you just lost one cell off of it, they would kind of all just sort of crumble and fall apart from one another. But because they have these nice tight junctions, when you lose cells, you lose them in sheets and they grow back um, in a nice uniform manner. So it helps to keep your body for the most part, especially the outer coverings and even the organs intact because they're nice nicely conjoined together via these adhesion junctions and these tight junctions. The gap junctions, their big job is just to allow the cells to communicate with one another. So here's a cell, here's a cell, here's a cell, here's a cell. We just didn't show the entire thing. We're just showing its wall. So looking at this guy's cell wall and looking at that guy's cell wall. And when I say cell wall, I mean just that part of the plasma membrane because animal cells don't have a cell wall. They have um, just the plasma membrane. So we can see that there's just the plasma membrane of both of those cells and we just cut away everything else. We just want to look at this part. So the job of these gap junctions is to allow for communication to take place between those cells so that they can exchange. And cells don't Facebook, they don't Snapchat, they don't text, they don't tweet. Um, so in order for cells to communicate, they have to do so with chemicals, um, chemical messengers, different types of cytokines, um, sodium molecules, potassium molecules, chloride molecules, different types of ions. So there are various different ways that cells can communicate with one another. So different metabolic pathways. Now that we have talked about the different structures of the cells and we've talked about the function of those structures, we've talked about why cells are small. Now we're going to talk about how cells make their energy. So the way that cells make their energy is that they are going to have to use chemical reactions to power everything that happens with them with inside of them. So metabolism is just the sum of all those chemical reactions. With metabolism, we're looking at the way that your body or cell breaks things down and then uses those building blocks of things that have been broken down to build up certain things. So there are two sides of metabolism, catabolic reactions and anabolic reactions. Metabolism is just the whole thing that's working together. The powerhouse of your cell is your mitochondria. That's where most of your energy that's made to in order to power metabolism. Other things that are needed in order to power metabolism are enzymes. Enzymes are always going to be proteins. The job of these specialized proteins is to speed up the rate of the reaction by working on a molecule, 
called a substrate. So you can either work on the substrate to either break it down or you can work on the substrate to build it up. The place that this breakdown or buildup happens on an enzyme is called the active site. So really cool things about an enzyme is that not only does it speed up the rate of the reaction, but they're not actually used up. Um, they can be recycled and reused after they're done either breaking things down or building things up. If you'll remember back in chapter two, when we break things down, um, it's some type, a type of degradation. So we have our substrate here. It comes in with our enzyme. It forms this enzyme substrate con complex. And we took this substrate and we broke it down into these two products. Notice the enzyme doesn't change. It's free to go and be used again to break down a similar substrate. When we have synthesis, we mean we wanna build things up. We're gonna take these two molecules put them in the active side of our enzyme, and then boom, make some bonds form between them and you have this product, product that comes out. And once again, that enzyme is not changed. So how enzymes work, how they're able to speed up the rate of the reaction is that what they're literally doing is lowering the amount of energy that's needed to start that reaction. We call that the energy of activation. So they can, at that active site, rearrange those components um, or put stresses on those bonds in such a way that that reaction can happen in a much faster time. A lot of times some of these enzymes are aided by special non-protein molecules that we call coenzymes. Vitamins are great examples of coenzymes. Um, CoQ10, which we we'll, would see in cellular respiration, is a really important coenzyme. Um, Acido coenzyme A is a really important coenzyme in cellular respiration as well. So what we notice here in this chart is that we have the energy of activation for this reaction to take place. When there is an enzyme present, this yellow line, or I guess that's orange, this orange line, notice that it takes less energy to get this reaction to take place than if there is no enzyme present. Um, so the way that an enzyme speeds up the, the rate of the reaction is that it lowers the amount of energy that's required for that re reaction to take place. So as I said before, that to do all this really cool stuff, you need the help of a mitochondria. And, um, and, and that, what that does is it provides energy. We call the mitochondria the powerhouse of the cell. And as I also said before, when we talked about the endosymbiotic theory, that mitochondria is about the same size and shape as a bacteria. It even has its own genetic material, um, and it has its own uh, little separately plasmid on there, and it has a double membrane bound uh, it's kind of got its own little membrane that goes around it as well. So through a process of cellular respiration, with the help of the mitochondria, we're able to take convert chemical energy stored in glucose into other types of energy in the form of ATP or adenosine triphosphate. And this ATP is vitally important to ensure that all of those things that need to take place, the action of the enzymes, the movement of the molecules in the endomembrane system, the contraction of the cell, if it's a muscle cell, um, to make sure that all that stuff takes place, we require ATP that's made in primarily, 90% of it, is made in the mitochondria. So here's a structure and a pretty picture of a mitochondria. Here's one with a transmission electron micrograph picture. And then here's just an artist rendition of it. And we have this um, little folds on the inside of it, the crusade, or the inner folds of the, of the mitochondria. And this is the site of um, the electron transport chain of cellular respiration. Um, and then out here in the outer matrix, we have the site of the Krebs cycle or the citric acid cycle of the um, cellular respiration. And all of these things I'm talking about, citric acid cycle, aka Krebs cycle, and the electron transport chain, those are just two of the three steps involved in cellular respiration. Cellular respiration is the process by which a starting material, and we're just gonna use glucose as our standard bearer, glucose and oxygen through a series of chemical reactions are converted into ATP, water, and carbon dioxide. Water, your body totally can use. ATP, your body totally can use. The carbon dioxide, we just exhale that out. So I'm not going to take time to go over um, cellular respiration in its entirety today. I do have other lectures posted on 
uh, YouTube if you'd like to learn more about cellular respiration. Um, but for right now, we're just going to talk about the, the hit the highlights there. So cellular respiration really is the production of ATP that takes us through that ATP ADB cycle. So when energy is needed, ATP is broken down into ADP or adenosine diphosphate. Um, and then you have this inorganic phosphate that we use. When energy is obtained from the food that we eat, um, we convert that chemical energy and we add a phosphate group back onto it and we turn ADP into ATP. So the cycle just continues to go on pretty much indefinitely until you're no longer with us. And here's just a really cool picture of that cycle taking place. So cellular respiration is a process by which glucose is broken down into carbon dioxide and water and you get ATP out of it. There are three different pathways, glycolysis, which happens in the cytoplasm of the cell, the citric acid cycle, known as the Krebs cycle, and the electron transport chain. Those second two pathways are in the mitochondria. So these pathways allow for energy to be released um, pretty slowly and controlled, and that energy or ATP, the cellular currency of energy in the cell is always called ATP, can readily be used. So here's just a really cool, very basic picture of cellular respiration where we have glucose that um, gets broken down via glycolysis, and then that um, glycolysis process is going to give us two molecules of pyruvate. That pyruvate is going to be changed into a slightly different form. So we have these prep steps on there. Um, and it goes into the citric acid cycle where it's completely broken down into carbon dioxide. And we have these electron carrier molecules. These electron carrier molecules will make their way to the electron transport chain. And we have a tremendous amount of ATP that is made. So we get ATP that comes out of this whole process. Now, we don't always have oxygen that's available in order to make this go down. So sometimes um, if your cells don't have enough oxygen to do what's needed. Then we can have a little bit of anaerobic respiration take place, which means it doesn't require any oxygen. So fermentation is a great example of that. Glycolysis typically still happens, but we don't get nearly as much ATP, we only get two ATP, and then we have this lactic um, lactate that actually will build up, and we call it lactic acid once it hits, um, gets, uh, once it hits oxygen, and then it becomes lactic acid. So you have this lactate buildup um, when our muscle cells have to go use fermentation in order to get some energy. All right, so that is all of chapter three. The next time we see each other, we're getting closer and closer to just talking about the human body systems, which I know which is why you paid for this class, but we need to really talk about some of the chemistry and the biochemistry and have a really good understanding, a good foundation before we get into that. So in chapter four, we're gonna talk about the four different tissue types that we find in the body and exactly what those tissue types do um, and make our way into really the meat and potatoes of the course. So thank you for coming today and I will see you in chapter four.